The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So today we're going to talk about uh, uh, relations. We're going to talk about partial orders. Wow, this is loud. Can you put it a bit softer? Um, so we're going to talk about relations, uh, partial orders, and then parallel task uh, scheduling. So, uh, well, we start out with a few definitions, as usual. <laughs> and uh, through examples, we will explain what we're talking about here. So what about relations? Well, relations are a very simple uh, definition. A relation from a set A to a set B is really a subset of the cross product of the two. So let me give an example. It's a subset R that is has its elements in a cross product of A and B, which really means that it has pairs where the first element is drawn from A and the second element is from B. So for example, um, if you're thinking about uh, the classes that you're taking as, say, set B, and all the students set A, well, then you can uh, describe this as a relationship uh, where we have tuples A, B, where student A is taking class B. So a relation is really just uh, a set of pairs. Uh, the first part of the pair is in set A, the second one in B. Um, now we will uh, use different notation for indicating uh, that a pair is in this subset. So we will be talking about further uh, properties, then it will become more clear. But we will also write that A is related to B. So instead of the pair AB is an element of R, we may write ARB. Or uh, we say A, and then we use uh, this symbol with a subscript R, B. So we use uh, um, uh, a relational symbol in between A and B in these two cases. And the reason for that becomes clear if we start talking about the properties. But let me first give a few more examples and uh, talk about the types of relationships, uh, uh, relations that we are really interested in. We really are interested in uh, a relation on a set A. And this is really um, a subset R that is in a cross product of A with itself. So essentially, A is equal to B in the definition right up here. Uh, now, examples that we have for this one is, for example, we may have A to be all the integers, positive and negative. And then we can say, for example, X is related to Y, if and only if um, X is, for example, um, congruent to y modulo 5. This would be a proper uh, relation. Um, we have not yet talked about special properties. We will come to that. Uh, other examples are, well, we could take um, uh, all the uh, a, a, a positive integers, 0, 1, and so, and, and so forth, and then write x is related to y if and only if, well, for example, we could say that x uh, divides y. That's another relationship that we could use. Notice, by the way, that uh, in the definition or in, in, in the characterization that I put here, I already use sort of relational symbols right in the middle between x and y over here. So that's already indicating why we are using the notation that I put up here. So another example is, uh, for example, we have um, that x is related to y if and only if um, x is 
um, at most y. This is also a relation. So now what are the special properties that we are interested in and those that will make relations special? And then we can talk about, uh, uh, oh, actually I forgot uh, one item that we will talk about as well, which are equivalence classes. Equivalence um, relations. So we will see when we talk about the properties right now that we will be uh, defining very special types of relations. And we will talk about these two, equivalence relations and partial orders. Okay, so what are the properties? Um, Actually, before we go into those properties, let us first describe uh, what the relationship, how, how we could describe it uh, in, in, in a different way. Actually, relation is nothing more than a directed graph. Like uh, R uh, over here is a subset of uh, A cross product with A, so it has pairs, and you can think of those as being edges. So let us write that down as well. So set A um, together with R um, is a directed graph. And the idea is very simple. Uh, the directed graph has vertices V and edge set E, uh, where we take V to be equal to A and the edge set equal to R. So for example, we could uh, create a small little uh, graph. For example, we have uh, three persons, uh, Julie and uh, Bill, and another one, Rob. And suppose that the directed edges indicate whether uh, one person likes the other. So for example, Julie likes Bill, and Bill likes himself, but likes no one else. Julie also likes Rob, but does not like herself. And Rob really likes Julie, but does not like himself. So for example, you could create a, 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 you could create a graph where all the directed edges really represent the, uh, um, the, um, the relations that you have described by R. So we will use this later on. And uh, the special properties that we're interested in is, is, is like, uh, are the following. So the properties are that relations can be uh, reflexive. So a relation uh, R on A is reflexive if um, X is related to itself for all X. So for all, for all X in A. Um, we have, uh, well, for example, in this particular graph, uh, that's not a case. Uh, if Julie and Rob would also like themselves, then the relationship up here would actually be reflexive. Uh, we have uh, symmetry. So we call a relationship symmetric if, well, if X likes Y, uh, then this should imply that Y also likes X. And this should, of course, hold for all X and Y. We have uh, a property that we call anti-symmetric. This is, which is the opposite of this. Anti-symmetric means that, well, if X likes Y and Y likes R, uh, X, then X and Y must be the same. So this really means that uh, it's not really possible to like someone else and that someone else also likes uh, uh, X because according to the anti-symmetric uh, property, that would then imply that X is actually equal to Y. So 
these are two definitions are, are, are opposite from one another. And the final one that we're interested in is transitivity. So let's uh, transitivity. Um, so a relationship is transitive if x uh, likes y and y likes z, then x also likes z. So let's have a look at uh, these few examples and see whether we can figure out um, what kind of properties they have. So let's make a table. And uh, let's first consider that x is congruent to y modulo 5. And next, uh, the visibility. And the other one is uh, less than or equal to. So are they reflexive is the first question. And then we want to know whether they are symmetric and anti-symmetric and transitive. So what about this one over here? So can you help me figuring out whether they are reflexive and symmetric or anti-symmetric and transitive? What, what kind of properties do, does this one have? So when we look at x is congruent to y modulo 5, it really means that the difference between x and y <coughs> is divisible by 5. So is it reflexive? Is x congruent to x modulo 5? It, it, it is, right? That's, uh, that's easy. So we have yes. Now, if x is congruent to y modulo 5, is y also congruent to x modulo 5? It is, right? Because the difference between x and y is divisible by 5, and it stays the same. And so y is congruent to x as well. So it is symmetric. Now, what about uh, anti-symmetric? Anti if x is congruent to y modulo 5, and y is congruent to x modulo 5, does that mean that x is equal to y? Can you? That's not, it's not really true, right? You can give a counterexample for that. Um, so, for example, we could have that, uh, well, 7 is uh, congruent to 2 modulo 5. Um, and at this, and uh, well, 7 is congruent to 2 modulo 5, and 2 is congruent to 7 modulo 5, but they're not the same. So this is not true. No. What about transitivity? Is this true? So let's consider this example as well. So if I have that uh, 2 and 7 are congruent to one another modulo 5, uh, well, 7 is also, for example, congruent to 12 modulo 5. Um, does it mean that 2 and 12 are congruent to one another? So we have 2 is congruent to 7 modulo 5. We have, uh, say, 7 is congruent to uh, 12 modulo 5. Well, we can uh, look at the difference between 2 and 12, which is 10. It's also divisible by 5. So actually, this does imply that 2 is congruent to 12 modulo 5. Now, this is, of course, not a proof, because this is just by example. But you can check it for yourself that this relationship is actually transitive. Now, what about divis divisibility? Maybe you can help me with this one. So is it uh, reflexive? It is, right? I hear yes. That's, that's correct, because if x and y are equal to one another, well, x is, is 1 times x, so x divides x, so that's true. Um, is it symmetric? So if x divides y and y divides x, um, so let's uh, see. We are over here. So if x divides y, does that imply that y divides x? That's the relation that we want to check. Is that true? Not really, right? We can have, like, say, 3 divides 9. But 9 does not divide 3. So this is not true. But anti-symmetry. So if x divides y, and also y divides x, then they must be equal to one another. 
so we can have, uh, we can see that this actually is anti-symmetric. So that's interesting. And transitivity, well, we have, uh, again, uh, transitivity because uh, hey, if, if x divides y and y divides z, then x also divides z. For example, if 2 divides, say, 4, and 4 divides 20, then 2 also divides 20. Now this one over here um, has actually the same properties as divisibility. Um, it's reflexive uh, because x is um, uh, at least equal to itself. <coughs> It's uh, symmetric. It's not symmetric because if x is at most y, it does not really imply that y is at most uh, x. So this particular relation does not hold in general. But it is again anti-symmetric because if I have this inequality and the other one, well, x and y must be equal to one another in that case, and transitive as well. Now it turns out that. Uh, in these examples, we have seen like a certain combination of, of, of properties that we will be talking about. The uh, kind of combination that we see here will lead to a definition of equivalence classes, uh, equivalence relations. And this is also a very usual pattern. And uh, these we will define as partial orders. So this is what we are going to talk about next. So we'll first start with equivalence relations. And um, yes, yeah, so let's do this. Um, what is an equivalence relation? An equivalence relation is exactly a relation that has those few properties over there. So it is reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So an equivalence relation um, is reflexive and also symmetric and also uh, transitive. So we have already seen some uh, examples up there, or one example, but. A very trivial relation, maybe you can think of one that is really straightforward. Um, what would be an equivalence relation if you think about uh, how we write mathematical formulas down? We use like the equality sign also, right? So just equality itself is already, uh, so equality, the equal sign uh, itself is actually Uh, one example. And the other example is uh, the one that we have up there, and that's of course more general. We can have x is congruent to y modulo n. So for fixed n, we have uh, another, equiv uh, another equivalence relation. So now given those, we can start defining equivalence classes. So what is an equivalence class? That's actually everything within that class is related to itself. So the equivalence class of an element x in A um, is equal to the set of all the elements uh, in A that are related, in A that are related to x by our relationship uh, by, by our relation R. So we denote this equivalence class. Uh, so this is denoted by X with brackets around it. So let's uh, put it into a formula and then give some examples. So uh, the formula for this in mathematics would be uh, the set of all the Y such that X is related to Y. So as an example, we can uh, uh, do the one that we started off with. Um, so let's again look at x is congruent to uh, y modulo 5. And look at uh, the equivalence classes. So one of them, for example, we could look at the equivalence class of 7. Um, we were looking at this one already. Well, 
what are all the um, y's that are actually uh, congruent to 7 modulo 5? Well, uh, there are a whole bunch. We have minus 3, and we have 2, 7, uh, we have 12, uh, 17, and 22, and so on. We add 5 to all of these, and this is uh, the equivalence class that belongs to 7. Now notice that the equivalence class of 7 is actually equal to the equivalence class of 12. It's the same set, right? Everything that's congruent to 12 modulo 5 is also congruent to 7 modulo 5. And this is again equal to, say, 17, and so on. OK, so now we can start talking about a nice property that uh, equivalence classes have, uh, which is that the equivalence classes together partition the set A. So I will need to define first what a partition is. And it's defined as follows. A partition uh, of A is a collection of disjoint uh, non-empty sets um, non-empty sets A1 up to a n, and they are all subsets of uh, of a, and the union of all of those is actually equal to the set a. So whose union is a? So let's have a look again at this example and see whether we can figure out what the, equiv what the equivalence classes are. Um, so the example is. Uh, well, we can have uh, everything that is actually a multiple of 5. That's, that's one class. So we have minus 5, 0, 5, 10, and then we go all the way up. Another equivalence class is, well, we can have, we just add 1 to each of those elements here. So if minus 4 is congruent to 1 modulo 5, is congruent to 6 modulo 5, congruent to 11, and so on. And so we can continue, and we actually see that we have minus 3 is congruent to 2, to 7, uh, to 12, and so on. It's the one we had up, the, up there. Uh, another one is uh, minus 2, um, 3, 8, 13, and we have minus 1, 4, 9, 14, and so forth. So these are all the equivalence classes, because uh, now we loop around. If we add one more to minus 1, we get uh, 0. So we get 0, 5, 10, 15, and so on. And that's exactly the same class as this one. So we see that uh, for, for this particular example, we notice that uh, these equivalence classes uh, are a partition of all the integers. It turns out that this is a general uh, a property. Um, and we're not going to prove this. Uh, that's pretty straightforward, so you should actually think about it yourself. Uh, let's keep this up here and take this out. So the theorem is that uh, every equivalence relation um, on a set A can be partitioned in its uh, equivalence classes. So the theorem is the equivalence class of, um, of an uh, equivalence relation Uh, on a set A, form a partition of A. Now, I'm not going to prove this. Uh, it is actually really straightforward, and you should really look at this and see that you can prove this with the properties, the property definitions, and 
the definition of an equivalence relation. So this is so far as we go with equivalence relations. Uh, so now we will continue with uh, partial orders. Again, we go through, through a few definitions, and then at some point we'll be able to prove a few interesting properties. So let's talk about uh, partial orders. Um, so notice that uh, we have shifted now from, in this diagram over here, in this table, from uh, this pattern that we were first interested in, now we go to partial orders, and the difference is going to be that uh, we do not have symmetry, but we do have anti-symmetry. And that brings out a whole different structure. So a uh, relation is a, and between brackets I put here weak, I will explain in a moment why I do this, it's a weak partial order if it is uh, reflexive and antisymmetric and transitive. Uh, and transitive. So why do I put uh, weak up here? Well, if you look in the book, there are two definitions. One is uh, a weak partial order, which is with, reflexif with um, reflexivity. And another one is a, a strong partial order. And that one um, has uh, a property that I did not talk about here called irreflexibility. And that's something that um, I will not talk about in this lecture, but you should read about it. And all these properties, all the theorems that we talk about right now also hold for the strong version of a partial order. So, but for now, let's just um, call partial orders those that are reflexive, uh, anti-symmetric, and transitive. Um, well, we already saw a few uh, examples up here. Um, we have the divisibility, uh, which has this property, uh, and also... Uh, um, uh, the less than or equal relationship. Um, now, usually, what we do is, instead of using a capital letter R, we will use a relation symbol. So, a partial order relation is denoted differently is denoted uh, with something like that, uh, instead of R. Now, the reason for that is because we uh, um, actually uh, will show that there's a partial order, so that we, we do not really, uh, so, so this name does not come by itself. Um, it turns out that we can give an order to the, or a ranking to the elements. One element is less than another, and so on. So, um, let's keep this over here, and change up here. Um, so, an example that we will talk about in a moment, but first, let me introduce some more notation. So uh, we call A, uh, the pair A with its relationship uh, symbol, um, is actually called a partially ordered set. And we also abbreviate this by calling it a poset. Now, in a poset, again, can be described by means of a directed graph. Um, so we can do that as well. So a poset is a directed graph uh, such that um, it has the vertex set A 
and the edge set is defined by uh, the relationship. So, and the edge set is actually this thing. Notice that in our definition, this is actually a set, right? It's still a set. It's a, it, it's a pair, it's, it's a set of tuples, uh, pairs, um, and uh, we can again create a directed graph by using this. So nothing has changed. But for post sets, we can actually uh, create uh, a more sort of uh, easier to read uh, um, sort of representation, which we'll call a Hesed diagram, and which is also a graph. And let me give an example to explain how that works. Um, so I think we can take this out. So the example is, uh, imagine that, uh, that uh, uh, a guy is going to dress up for uh, something very formal. So how does he start out? So let's uh, have as vertices in the graph, in this diagram, or the elements of A, is going to be all his, uh, the items that he will start uh, to put on and start wearing. So his pants, uh, shirt, and so on. So, okay, let's have a look. So. What do you start off with? Um, well, maybe your underwear would be a good idea. Um, so this could be a first uh, item that you want to put on. So let's, let's have the relation that we are interested in to be one uh, where we say, well, I first need to put on my underwear, and only after that I can put on my pants, for example. So that makes sense too. And since I'm doing something very formal later on, I better first put on my shirt because I like to tuck that into my pants. But it's not really necessary to first put on my underwear or first put on my shirt. I can do either of the two. So we're getting sort of a, uh, you know, I don't care so much. I want to put on a tie, uh, put on a jacket as well. And, uh, after the pants, I need to put on my belt. But I like to finish all that before I put on my jacket. And I also have my uh, right sock that I like to put on. And if I, I need to do this first before I put on my right shoe. That makes sense. And I definitely like to finish putting on my pants before I put on my shoes. So let's have a preference relationship over here as well. And, but I do not really care actually. I can put on my socks first uh, and then my underwear and then my shirt. I don't mind so much. I also have my left uh, sock and my left uh, shoe. And again, I like this uh, to be preceded by putting on my pants. So this could be a relation, a sort of a description of a partial order. Um, well, um, we call this a Hesse diagram, so let's talk about it a little bit. And then I will define what the official definition of, of, of this is. Um, so let's first look at this. So this is a partial order. Uh, it, 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 it means to represent a partial order. So it's reflexive. I mean, uh, uh, sort of before I need to put on my, so, so my the, the pants are related to themselves, uh, so I put them on. Uh, before I put on uh, the underwear, uh, be before I put on the pants, I need to put on the underwear. But if I need to put on my belt after I put on my underwear, then also, I know that I first need to put on my underwear before I put on my belt. So you have transitivity in this, uh, in, 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 in this example. Um, we have that uh, uh, it's also, uh, the other property is that it is uh, uh, anti-symmetric. Uh, it's not true that I can first put on my right shoe and then my right sock. Um, so we only have a, a one direction over here. 
Now, I did not put in all the edges that are possible for this partial order because if I really want to continue this, um, if, if I really want to make, uh, to create the complete directed graph that I talked about over here, um, I think I talked about it somewhere, uh, over here, I can, I can create a directed graph that has this vertex set A, which are all the items that I want to put on, and uh, an edge set that uh, has all the different uh, relationships. Now this is only an abbreviated form, this is a Hesse diagram, but if I would look at the directed uh, graph, then I would need to look at the closure of this whole thing, that's how I would call it. Um, and uh, I know that, uh, for example, this underwear by transitivity is also less than or equal than or related to the belt. So in a uh, full graph, I would um, I would have uh, another edge over here. And in the same way, I would have an edge from here to here. I would have an edge over here by transitivity. Also, I can see that the shirt goes before the pants, before the right shoe. So the shirt is also related all the way to the right shoe. And similarly to the left shoe. I also have that I have uh, self loops in here like a tie is related to itself, and a jacket as well, and so forth. So I can put in all these extra edges, and as you can see, that's going to be uh, quite a mess. That, that, will, that will be quite a mess. So the Hesse diagram is a much nicer visual interpretation of what's going on. So let's define what this really is. Um, and Then we can continue with some nice uh, properties of, uh, of this structure. Okay, so. So what is a Hesse diagram? A Hesse diagram is really one in which um, I use Uh, the set A as the vertices. So it is a directed graph, a different one, one from the, than the one that we talked about up there. So it's a directed graph in which um, we have the vertex set A, but the edge set is a little bit different. So it is the edge set uh, that corresponds to this, but we subtract a whole bunch. First of all, we remove all the self loops that we have. So minus all the self loops. And we also take out uh, all the edges that are implied by transitivity. So that's the definition of a Hesse diagram. Um, now when we look at the Hesse diagram over here, uh, we can see that, um, so let me take out these uh, notes again, or these edges. So looking at this Hesse diagram, you really see a nice structure in there. It seems like we can talk about uh, smallest elements, like a shirt is like a, a small element. It's sort of uh, less than or equal to, if you think about this as being, if representing that, then the tie and the jacket and the pants and the right shoe and so on. So you can see a clear order in this particular graph. So, so let's uh, uh, yeah, have a look at this. It, 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 when, when I look at this graph, I also do not see any uh, cycles, right? I do not see that the shirt is less than equal to the pants, it's related to the right shoe, and then it's related to itself again. So I do not see any cycles. And this turns out to be a general property of uh, posets, and that's what we are going to prove next. 
And so let's do that over here. So So we see that uh, there are no cycles, and that's a general property. So the theorem is that a post set has no um, uh, directed cycles other than Uh, self loops. Now, notice that this property is really necessary to have a proper representation by using a Hesse diagram, because otherwise, if you have a big uh, a directed uh, cycle, then uh, uh, yeah, the edges are sort of uh, yeah, only one of those edges would be part of the Hesse diagram, and all the others are implied by transitivity, sort of. And that is getting a little bit messy, because then we do not really have a unique representation. But uh, luckily, there are no directed cycles. So how do we prove this? Um, well, let's uh, use, uh, let's do this by contradiction. And see what happens. So suppose the contrary. So suppose that actually there exists an n at least two, an integer at least two, so at least n distinct elements, uh, a1 all the way up to a n, that form a cycle. So such that, such that we have a directed cycle. So we would put that in formula like this. A1 is related to A2, to A3, and so on, all the way up to uh, An minus 1, An. And we have a cycle, so this goes back to A1. Uh, so why would this be a contradiction? So Maybe you can help me out here. So what, what can I uh, already derive from those properties that I have over here? So I know that the partial order is anti-symmetric. Um, it is transitive. It's reflexive. So what, how, how, how can I get to a contradiction here? So let's think about it a little bit. Um, is it possible, for example, that we could uh, violate the anti-symmetry of, 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 of the uh, uh, post set? So can we find maybe two distinct elements such that, say, x is related to y and y is related to x? And, but, but you know, it's, uh, it's not true that x is equal to y. For example, if we have a very simple, uh, if we have a very small cycle, say a1 is less than or equal to, uh, is related to a n and then related to a1 again, well then I would have that a1 is related to a n and a n is related to a1. We should have that a n is then equal to a1, but that's not true because we assume distinct elements over here. So that seems to be an interesting idea, so maybe we can, uh, uh, prove something of that type. So can we actually show that A1 is uh, uh, related to An? We can, right? What kind of property of a post set do we use here to make that happen? Um, yeah, I, I heard something vaguely, a, a mumble. <laughs> yeah, the transitive property. So how do we do it? Uh, well, we take those three together and we conclude that A1 is also related to A3. Well, we have A4 over here. So together with this one, so A1 is related to A3 and A3 is related to A4, 
we have that A1 is related to A4. And you can use induction if you, uh, if you want to be very precise here, which you should actually, but I will not do this. So we will use induction. We'll go all the way to the fact that A1 is actually related to An. But wait a minute. We also have this particular property. And A1 is not equal to An by our assumption. So we get a contradiction, which means that what we had over here is not true. So actually for all n, at least two, and distinct elements uh, a1 up to a n that are, uh, uh, well, we have the negative of this, so there is no uh, cycle. So this is uh, a great property. So now we start to see why a post set is actually called a partial ordered set, right? Because there's no directed cycles other than the self loops. So we sort of have a ranking to the elements. We can say that uh, really one, one element is ranked less than another. So this one is ranked less than this, it's ranked less than that. And I cannot circle back again and say that this one is ranked less than this because I don't have cycles. So that makes a really consistent story. Notice that this was different in when we talked about tournament grass, for example, right? That was a very different structure, and we could not think of a winner in, in there. Okay, so but in this case, we have, um, we have a ranking. And this leads us to a more uh, general uh, um, uh, uh, discussion. But before we go into that, um, I like to write down a conclusion of this uh, theorem. So after deleting uh, the self loops, we uh, from a post set, we actually uh, get a directed acyclic graph. And that's what we defined last week as well. So a directed acyclic graph. And we abbreviate this as a DAG, a DAG. So that's a very special uh, uh, property for the post set. Now, a partial order uh, has elements that cannot be compared, for example. Like in this case, these two have absolutely no uh, relationship with one another. Even through transitivity, uh, I cannot conclude that either the right sock is related uh, to the underwear or the underwear related to the right sock. Um, and uh, that makes it a partial order. It's possible that you have elements, pairs of elements, that are incomparable. So let me write this down. Um, so what we really want to, though, is that we have some kind of consistent ranking that we can create for a partial ordered set. But uh, for now, we know that certain pairs cannot be compared to one another, and we would like to achieve some something like this. So that's why we start to talk about uh, what it means if A and B are incomparable. And uh, this is if neither A is related to B or uh, nor uh, B is related to A. And uh, we say that A and B are comparable. Well, if A is related to B or B is related to A. And now we can have a very special order, which we call a total order. In a total order, in a total order, um, it's actually a partial order, but all the elements are comparable. 
So it's a partial order in which every pair of elements is comparable. Now maybe you can think about the Hesse diagram of a total order. What would it look like if we have that all the pairs or the, all the elements are actually comparable? Do you have an idea of what, the, what kind of a graph would that be? So in this case we had a partial order because uh, we see that certain items cannot be compared. Um, but what happens if you have a total order? So a total order, um, you know, for example, if, uh, yeah, do you have a, do you, do you know? Yeah, that's correct. It will be a straight line. And uh, yeah, the, it will look like something like this. And it keeps on going. And over here also, keeps on going like this. So it's a straight line. If it's a finite set, we have a finite uh, line, so just uh, a finite number of vertices. But otherwise, it's just uh, an infinite line, or half, or semi-infinite line. So, uh, yeah, why is that? Because uh, with every two elements, they can be compared to one another, so you can rank them, essentially, along this line. So if you think about the integers and the less than or equal to relation, well, we see that one is less than or equal to two, and two is less than or equal to three, and so on. So they all are uh, put in the Hesse diagram as a straight line. So that's a very special order. We have a ranking with the total order through this straight line. Um, it would be great if we can also rank the elements in a partial order. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Um, we're going to talk about the topological sort of a poset. And what it really means is that we're going to to extend essentially the partial order towards a total order. And by doing that, we will manage to put a ranking to all the items. Okay, let me define what's happening here. Um, so, this is about equivalence classes. And you remember this. So, So what is a, a topological sort? So the idea is that um, a total order that is consistent with, if the, to if the total order is consistent with a partial order, um, then it is called a uh, topological sort. So let me redefine it again more formally. Topological sort. So what is it? Um, a topological sort of a poset is formally defined as uh, a total order is a total order that has the same set of, uh, of, of items of elements A, but has a different relation that we will denote by uh, a subscript T, and this is such that, well, the original relation is contained in the new one. Notice that these also denote sets, so that's why I can write it like this. So this set that is defined by this relation is a subset of this relation. So it simply means that if uh, x is related to y, then it also implies that x is related to, uh, to y in the total order. Okay, so 
uh, we are interested in figuring out if we can find such a topological sort. Is it always possible to do so? Now, it turns out that every finite, um, every finite uh, um, poset actually has a topological sort, and we're going to prove this. And how do we do that? So let me first write out the theorem. The theorem is that every finite poset has a topological sort. The basic idea is that we're going to, in order to prove this, is that we're going to look at a minimal element in the poset. For example, in the diagram we have four minimal elements. I will define what that means. Uh, the left sock and the right sock and the underwear and the shirt are all at the top of the Hesse diagram. Those are minimal elements. I just take one of them, take it out of uh, the poset that I'm looking at, I will get a smaller poset and recursively I'm going to construct my uh, total order. So I have a total order on the smaller uh, poset and then I add the minimal element back to it and then I get a total order for the whole thing. So essentially I'm going to use induction and before I can do that I'm going to first talk about what it means um, to have a minimal element because that's what we need. So x in A is called minimal if it's not true that there exists a y in A which is different from x but such that y is smaller than x. So there, is, there exists no other y in A that is smaller than x. Then, if that's true, we call x a minimal element. And in the same way, of course, we can talk about a maximum, a maximal element. It's exactly the same, but at the very end, we will have the reverse, so x is related to y. Now, it turns out that not every post set has a minimal element, actually. So, as an example, uh, we may consider the integers, the, the, the negative and positive numbers, and the less than or equal to relation, there does not exist a minimal element. You can always find a smaller element. So it's not really true that every post set actually has a minimal element. It turns out, though, that in a finite post set, we do have a minimum element. And then we can start doing the proof by induction. So let's prove this that every finite poset set has a minimum, has a minimal uh, uh, element. So let's do that up here. Actually, we do need this theorem later on. So let's start out here. Um, so the lemma that we want to prove is that uh, every finite poset has a minimal element. And in order to do that, we're going to define what is called a chain. And a chain is a sequence of elements uh, that are related to one another. It's a sequence of distinct elements such that uh, a1 is smaller than a2, smaller than a3, and so on, up to some at. And the length of a chain we will denote by t. So this is going to be the length. So now let's have a proof of this lemma. And with that lemma, we will then be able to prove the theorem that we want to do uh, on the topological uh, sort. Okay. So 
Let's see how we can do this. Um, so what's the proof going to be? Um, well, we want to construct a minimal element that we think would be minimal. And how are we going to do it? We're going to look at the chain that has, uh, uh, that has the largest length, the maximum length. So let's, um, so let A1 related to A2 and so on to An be a maximum length chain. Now I'm cheating here a little bit because how do I know that uh, such a chain actually exists? Does there exist a maximum length chain? So that you may want to think about. So it actually does exist. And uh, if you think about it yourself, then uh, you will actually uh, use the fact that we use a finite poset. If you have a finite number of elements, well, the maximum length chain can be at most the number of elements in the poset. So uh, you always have a maximum uh, number, but you can prove it more formally by using the well-ordering principle. But I will not do that here. So um, we assume for now that this just exists, but you can prove it. So let's uh, look at two cases. We have a case, so, so what do we want to do? We want to show that A1 is actually a minimum element. So let us consider any other element in the set. Um, and then we have two cases. Either A is actually not part of A1, A2, all the way up to An. Well, in that case, um, if A is less than A1, well, what goes wrong? I can put A up front here. It's a different element from all the others. I get a longer chain. So that's, that's not possible, right? So I would get a longer uh, chain. And that's a contradiction. So this assumption is not true. So it's not true that A is less than A1. What's the other case? The other case is that A is an element of one of those. So it's one of those in the chain. Now let's have a look what happens if A is less than or equal to A1. But wait a minute, if A is part of one, is one of these, and A is less than or equal to A1, then I will have a cycle. A1 is less than or equal to a little up to A, is less than or equal to A1, but we just showed in the theorem that there are no directed cycles in a pose set. So this would imply that we have a cycle. And according to the theorem up there, we have a contradiction. So also in this case, it's not true that A is less than A1. Now this is the definition of a minimal element. So let's have a look at this definition. We've proved now that, uh, that, that for every possibility, uh, every possible item or element in set A, uh, it's not true that A is smaller than, um, that that new element is smaller than, uh, than A1. So A1 is actually a minimum element according to the definition. So A1 is minimal, that's what we have shown. So great, we have showed that there exists a minimum element. So this is the end of this proof.